Welcome to another edition of Hey DT. Hey DT is a series of videos I do where I respond to viewer questions and comments. These viewer questions and comments, they typically come from comments on the videos posted on YouTube and Odyssey. Sometimes these questions and comments, they come through social media such as Mastodon, Reddit, sometimes through email. And the very first question I want to respond to is, Hey DT, what is your escape plan after your YouTube career? Hopefully not too early. Are you going back to retail? Are you going to start out as a software developer? Or do you want a pony farm? Well, I will say I never see myself not doing this. I, I think I found my calling in life as far as video content creation. I love getting in front of a camera, love getting in front of a microphone, and I like teaching people. I've always been a teacher. You know, in every job I've ever had, I've had teaching jobs and of course retail supervisor positions. I often taught people. I was in human resources uh, a lot of the time. And, and this is what I enjoy doing. And I really enjoy making audio video content these days. I, I've really enjoyed this. So I never see myself not doing all of this. So I don't have any plans of going back to retail. I have no plans of being a software developer ever. I can't imagine doing that because I don't think it's work I would enjoy. I'm, I do a little programming, a little scripting on the side as a hobby just for fun. But if it was a career, you know, if I had to make a paycheck from that, it would no longer be something I could do for fun, right? It would be actual work and I'd probably hate it. As far as having a pony farm, I wouldn't mind actually one day stopping living in the city, you know, quit being a city dweller and go out in the middle of the woods, you know, live out in, out in the woods. I would like that because I would like, you know, having a garden or a farm even. I'd like raising animals, chickens, turkeys, ducks, pigs, goats. I, you know, I, I like animals. I'm an animal lover. I like being outdoors. I like nature. I like being out in the woods. I like hunting. I like fishing. So I could see myself doing that at some point, leaving the city and, and going out into the woods. But I would still try to have enough technology around me that I could still do this kind of work because again from this day forward I can't imagine me ever not making video content not necessarily about Linux free and open source software because I could teach people a variety of different subjects but I, I think this will be my calling in life from this day forward and the next question is really a comment. It's about some of my Arch Linux packages, some of my personal software that I package up in the AUR and the DTOS core repository. He writes, hey, DT, I might suggest doing the configuration file in the user's home directory instead. Perhaps on first run, you could create some default list in the .config directory. OK, well, here's something I often get people telling me about you know, DM scripts, shell color scripts, and some of these other packages that I've got in the AUR is why don't I put the config files or, you know, any libraries associated with those programs in the user's home directory in .config where they don't need sudo privileges to edit things and stuff like that. Well, here's the problem. On Arch Linux, anything you install in Arch Linux through Pac-Man or AUR packages, anything, you're not allowed to touch the home directory. You, you can't install anything in a user's home directory, right? It has to be in the root file system somewhere. So that is why I don't do that. And that's why I, I'm never going to be able to do that. It's, it's just not possible. It's just not allowed with Arch packaging. And really, it makes sense. You really don't want to be playing around in a user's home directory because the user's home directory, of course, is where they store their personal data typically, right, is where they store all their documents. You really don't want people's uh, installation scripts to be messing around in that directory, right? You want to be placing things in, you know, slash Etsy, slash opt, and things like that. That's where configuration files for installed programs really should go. They shouldn't be in the user's home directory. Let the user move that stuff from slash Etsy, for example, to his home directory if he wants to mess around with a, a config file, but let him do that himself. And instead of having a script or installation process mess around in that directory for them. And the next question involves, again, one of my packages in the AUR. It is the shell color scripts package. He says, hey, DT, I installed the shell color scripts from the AUR, but every time I update the packages with yay, I get this shell color scripts colon local is newer than AUR. What does this mean? It means that you have two different versions of shell color scripts. Well, you have one on your system that's installed and it's a newer version than the one that the AUR was going to install. So you probably installed shell color scripts 
from the DTOS core repository, if you have my DTOS repository enabled, then the versioning is different. And the one you already have is a newer version or Arco Linux, if you're running Arco Linux, they have shell color scripts also packaged up for Arco Linux in their repositories, and that could be causing some issues as well. So uh, you've got several different versions of shell color scripts out there, right? You got the one in the DTOS repository, the one in the Arco repository, and the one in the AUR. Of course, you can also just git clone it from GitLab as well. And yes, there, there's going to be package conflicts because sometimes one of those will get updated before the other. And then you run into this situation where, you know, you've got a newer version installed and in, from one repository than the one you're trying to install from a different repository. So it, you're, you're good. If you already got shell color scripts on your system, you're good, right? Uh, and what you could do if, if for some reason the versioning is all screwed up and you really want the one from the AUR rather than the one you've already got installed, just uninstall the one you've got, right? And then install it from the AUR, specifically install it from the AUR because when you're doing installations through Pac-Man or with Yay or Paru, any of the AUR helpers, you can specify, hey, I want the AUR version of this package, not the one that's in the actual core repository or the DTOS repository or the Arco repository, depending on which one. Moving on to the next question is, hey DT, do you think DTOS is stable enough now to install on my main machine? Uh, I, I won't ever call it stable because I don't want people to actually ask me for support or anything i'm not responsible for what you do on your machine if you install it great if something happens hey it's on you right <laughs> is it stable it's just an installation script right it installs some stuff through pac-man that's all dtos does it installs a bunch of programs and it enables a dtos repository where it installs some of my personal packages like dm scripts shell color scripts and then all of my config files that's all the DTOS script does. It really doesn't do anything that could really be damaging in any way. So I would say, yeah, you have nothing to worry about, but still, I'm not going to be anybody's support channel. So <laughs> again, install it at your own risk. If you have problems, you're probably going to have to work on those problems yourself. Um, maybe other people will help you out. I don't have time to, to support it myself. I mean, I put this stuff on GitLab, but I got a lot of other things going on, right? It's one of the th reasons why I don't do like my own ISOs. I don't try to be my own Linux distribution because that would be such a time sink, right? I, w I would basically have to quit doing videos to be people's support channels. If, if I actually made my own Linux distribution, for example, I don't want to do that. That's not fun. Right? That's, that's not what I want to do. I want to do this kind of stuff. So yeah, install DTOS, have fun. It, it, it should be safe. It shouldn't permanently damage anything, right? But just know that any kind of issues you run into, you may have to do the homework yourself. And if you're cool with that, go ahead. If you're already used to Arch Linux and how Arch Linux works, you're going to have no problems with DTOS. And moving on to the next question. Hey DT, how do you change your videos so much? Sometimes you're here in the studio, other times you're out in the woods and even have a beard and mustache. Well, the beard and mustache is sometimes I shave, sometimes I don't. As far as the actual setting of the videos, yeah. So I like changing things up. I record most of my videos here in the office, but I do a lot of different camera angles, right? Like the ones for Hey DT or typically this camera angle, the ones for my typical videos where I'm doing something, a tutorial on my desktop or slightly different camera angle. You know, sometimes I'm facing that particular direction and you guys see a camera angle facing toward my monitors. Yeah, I'm always trying different things. I, I like variety. It keeps this fun for me. I think it also keeps it fun for you guys, right? A lot of you guys appreciate a, a little change. I know you guys really love when I go outdoors, when I'm strolling around in my backyard talking about whatever's on my mind, unscripted. Most of my videos are unscripted because I think I'm more natural in that setting. So yeah, you know, again, I like variety. I like change. I like, you know, trying different stuff out. You know, I, I throw everything at the wall just to see what sticks. The next question is one I get a lot on the channel. I don't understand why people don't understand this one is, hey DT, why do you keep calling Vivaldi proprietary software? The only non-open source component is the skin. Okay, well, if it's got some non-open source components, it's proprietary, right? <laughs> proprietary software is proprietary. Open source software is open source, right? If anything is closed source at all as part of a project, guess what? 
it's not open source, right? It doesn't count. You can't say, well, part of it's open source, so you got to call the whole thing open source. That's not the way it's, it works. That's not the way it's ever worked. Otherwise, Microsoft Edge is open source because the Chromium engine it's based on is open source, right? Google Chrome is open source because it's based on an open source Chromium engine. Google Chrome and Microsoft Edge are, are obviously proprietary garbage. No one ever tries to claim those are open source browsers. Well, I've actually had people message me <laughs> claiming both of them were open source, similar to Vivaldi. But for, for some reason, a lot of you guys want to give Vivaldi a complete pass. And I, I get it. You like Vivaldi. You think it's a great browser. And for some reason, it bothers you that it's proprietary software. You guys in the free and open source community, you guys using Linux, you use mostly free and open source software, and now you're using this proprietary browser, and now you're trying to trick yourself into thinking it's open source, right? You're trying to convince me and convince others that it's open source when it really isn't. Let me put it to you this way. Anything that has any closed source stuff in it is not open source, right? It's either fully open source or it's not open source, right? Otherwise, then practically everything is open source software at this point because most pieces of software have some open source stuff built into it, right? We're to the point where open source is rather prevalent, right? There is a difference though. You're either open source or you're closed source. You can't be somewhere in between. You can't be, well, I'm, I'm partly open source. That's like saying, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm not, Dead, I'm just half dead, right? That's, that's, that's not the way it works. You're either alive or you're dead. So really, the people asking this question, you guys have problems because it bothers you that you're using a piece of proprietary software. I know it does. You wouldn't ask me this question if it didn't bother you. So either come to terms that you don't care about free and open source software and you'll use proprietary software if it's convenient. That's okay. Just admit that to yourself and be okay with that or admit that you're not okay with that and actually switch to a free and open source browser that's actually 100% open source. So uh, again, don't, don't try to convince me of this nonsense. I'm not buying it. And honestly, if you're asking this question, I don't really believe you're buying the, uh, the open source argument for Vivaldi either. Moving on to the next question. Hey DT, what's your thoughts about adding something like the Plasma Shell to tiling window managers? Uh, doesn't really matter. A tiling window manager, the, the main focus of a tiling window manager is the actual window manager itself and how it tiles windows, how it handles multi-monitors and things like that. That extra plasma stuff like your menu system, the panel, that's the only other thing you're getting with plasma, right? If we're not talking about the window manager, you're getting a menu system and a panel where everybody that runs a tiling window manager, well, most people are going to add a panel to their tiling window manager, whatever panel they want. And most of them will use some kind of menu system or maybe a run launcher like D-Menu or Rofi. So you're not going to gain anything by adding some extra stuff from Plasma to your tiling window manager. In many cases, I think you're probably going to be losing stuff by trying to incorporate elements of a full desktop environments like Plasma, GNOME Shell, things like that into a tiling window manager because you're trying to shoehorn things in that don't really belong. You're trying to fit things. You're trying to a square peg in a round hole and, and that's just not going to work. A tiling window manager and your desktop environments that traditionally use floating window managers, they were built for two entirely different kinds of workflows and you can't really try to piece them together and make them as some kind of coherent piece of software. It's just not going to work. And the final question is, hey, DT, if DT was a company, what would it look like? OK, well, this is interesting because I'm not exactly sure where he's going with this, but I'm going to interpret it one way and, and I'll go ahead and answer it because I, I think it's kind of interesting. So if DT was a company, he's probably asking if DT was like a large billion dollar corporation and, you know, where we all use free and open source software and things like that. I'm not going to get into that because that's fantasy land and it's not something likely to happen. Now, if DT was a company, DT is kind of a company, right? I'm a sole proprietor. I basically work for myself. I may one day actually incorporate, you know, do an LLC or something. But in many ways, what you guys see me <laughs> Personally, it's also a company, the channel, for example, you know, I run this as a business. And what would DT Inc. look like right? if I incorporated? Well, for one thing, I'd make sure that DT Inc. would be impervious to cancellation. I want to make sure that I am not able 
to ever be canceled. That's one of my most important considerations with the work I do. You see it all the time on platforms like YouTube, for example, people that build uh, subscriber bases of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in some cases, more than a million subscribers, and then they get their channel deleted, right? They get their account suspended for whatever reason. Maybe they did something dumb. Maybe they didn't. There's been plenty of people that have accidentally got tripped up in the YouTube algorithms and bad things have happened to their channels. And, and that's scary. So you, you definitely want to be you want to be on more than one video distribution platform. That's kind of why I post to Odyssey and YouTube. Odyssey was kind of my backup plan for a long time. Now, Odyssey Odyssey has, has slowly kind of fallen out of favor since the cryptocurrency crash. Right? All crypto, the prices of crypto have, have really gone down here in the last year. And that's caused a lot of people to kind of abandon Odyssey because nobody can really make money on Odyssey now where, you know, a year, year and a half ago, you'd make a lot of money on Odyssey. Like it was a viable alternative to YouTube where now I, I couldn't make a living just posting on Odyssey. But, you know, these things, they they have ups and downs. I'm sure the cryptocurrency stuff will, will go back up one day. Odyssey also has a lawsuit against them right now with the SEC. They've got to win that lawsuit before anybody will really trust that platform again, I think. So for me, I want to be impervious to cancellation. I don't want to be able to be canceled, which means I don't want to be beholden to sponsors. I don't want to depend solely on sponsorship money, corporate sponsors, you know, because once you're dependent on that money, then you have to do what those sponsors want you to do. And if you don't, then they can cancel you. Right? You want to be platform independent, or at least you want to be on multiple platforms. And the other thing, obviously, I'll get to free and open source software. I don't want to be dependent on proprietary software at all. Many of you guys know this, but me making my videos, I use strictly free and open source software to do everything. And, you know, some of these free and open source tools, they're not they're not the best tools, right? I'm sure, you know, proprietary video editors like Premiere Pro and DaVinci would be much better than Caden Live and Blender and some of the other open source video editors I use. But still, I don't want to be locked into those proprietary platforms. I don't want to be locked into proprietary formats because they save things in proprietary formats, a lot of proprietary software, where it can just cause you so many headaches down the road, so much heartache. You can lose a lot of work. If I want my work to last forever, it needs to be entirely created in free and open source software using free and open source formats. So that's a little bit of what DT Inc currently looks like and what it probably will look like going forward. That's it for this edition of Hey DT. Before I go, I need to thank the sponsors of the show. I need to thank the producers, which are Devin, Gabe, James, Matt, Michael, Mitchell, Paul, Scott, Wes, Allen, Armor Dragon, Chuck, Commander Angry, Diokai, Dylan, George, Lee, Linux, Ninja, Maxim, Mike, Erion, Alexander, Peace, Arch, Medora, Polytech, Red Prophet, Steven, and Willie. These guys, they're my highest tiered patrons over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode you just watched would not have been possible. The show is also brought to you by each and every one of these ladies and gentlemen as well. All these names you're seeing on the screen right now these are all my supporters over on patreon let me show you some more names here all these fine ladies and gentlemen help support me over on patreon because i don't have any corporate sponsors corporate sponsors get you canceled right i'm sponsored by you guys the community if you like my work and you want to help support me and want to see more videos on linux free and open source software subscribe to distrotube over on patreon all right guys peace